Welcome, everyone. I'm Philip. This is Sandroy. Hey. Uh, as was said, we're going to be talking today about our experiences building a Java compiler using LLVM. Work with legal slide I'm required to show you. Don't quote me on anything I say. Uh, I want to emphasize that we are presenting on the behalf of an entire team. All mistakes we make are ours. All credit, of course, goes to the team. So what we are in the process of doing is building a production-grade, just-in-time compiler for Java bytecode. We're going to mostly focus on Java today, but this is a compiler for Java bytecode and is valid for any language that compiles to bytecode. Uh, some of the sort of, so you understand where we're coming from on the project. This is really targeted at server workloads where peak throughput is the primary constraint. Uh, we are a just-in-time compiler, but we are a very high-tier just-in-time compiler. So if you come into this thinking that compile time is going to be the key constraint, get that out of your head. Some of the things we'll say won't make sense with that as a mindset. Uh, we already have an existing tier one and interpreter, so this is a high-tier jet. And then finally, I want to really emphasize that, as you saw on the previous slide, it is a fairly small team. So the debugability maintainability of the resulting compiler was an absolute key goal from the very beginning. The way we think about what we've built is as an in-memory compiler. What we mean by that is we're not really using any of the JIT infrastructure provided by LLVM, with some very narrow exceptions. All of the complex pieces of building a just-in-time compiler, the profiling information, the compilation policy and code replacement, all of those pieces already existed in an existing uh, runtime. Uh, one of the areas we'll talk about in some detail today will be interoperating with the deoptimization implementation within that runtime, but we'll get to that in just a moment. The only parts of LLVM that we're actually using are sort of the optimizer and the code generator and a couple of pieces out of MCJIT related to effectively a dynamic loader to load, sort of relocate objects in memory. Uh, one of the things I want to emphasize that turned out to be surprisingly important is that we have a runtime where we control the entire ABI. Uh, there are times where it has been convenient to tweak the runtime rather than tweak the compiler, where doing something in the compiler would have been a very hard challenge, and doing it in the runtime was relatively simple. A great example of this is we had a runtime stub that had a very weird calling convention, and we were able to just introduce a new stub that had a much simpler calling convention rather than teaching LLVM an entirely new way of doing calls. Uh, sort of the architecture of the compiler that we built, uh, we have a high-level IR that is actually embedded within LLVR, um, uh, sorry, LLVM IR. This is in contrast to what we saw earlier today with SIL, and we'll talk about some of the trade-offs here as we go through. We have uh, a set of callbacks that have been added to the optimizer in certain key passes that ask factual questions back to the VM. And by very carefully structuring those callbacks, we've arranged it in such a way that we're able to preserve the ability to completely replay a compile entirely outside of the VM. So starting with that higher level embedded IR, uh, most of our front end goes ahead and lowers directly to fairly normal low level IR. However, we have a number of what we call abstractions, which are higher level notions that represent semantic bits and pieces of information that are hard to reverse engineer out of the IR. So a great example here is the lock or unlock operation on a Java object. We'll generally have a fast path and a slow path, and recognizing what that is out of the IR would be really tricky. But by having the abstraction, we're able to implement, for example, lock coarsening or lock elision uh, over that higher level abstraction. Then, uh, just as was shown earlier in SIL, we have various lowering phases we run through where we lower those abstractions out of the way. Uh, sort of the background on why we chose to do it in a high-level embedded IR is sort of two separate pieces. The first is that one of the problems with building the split structure that you saw earlier with uh, SIL is that you end up having to implement large chunks of the optimizer twice, and we were really hoping to avoid doing that. The other part was, quite frankly, we didn't have the experience to know what the right set of choices around that division was on day one. The structure of our high-level IR has actually changed fairly radically throughout the process. And the ability to be able to make those changes easily, because it's just an LLVM function and a couple of minor tweaks here and there, has been an incredibly powerful thing. 
Uh, when we first started this, we had a lot more abstractions than we have today. We've actually moved in the direction of fewer and fewer abstractions over time. In the end, we might end up with none, for all I know. So this is sort of a pictorial picture of what the entire system looks like. We've got the virtual machine up at the top, which hands off a piece of Java bytecode to our compiler front end. That front end is deliberately kept as simple as it can possibly be. It generates the IR that we hand off to the optimizer. Uh, we run that through the optimizer, and then as I mentioned in key passes, for example, in iscombine, we'll have factual questions that'll go back to the VM to sort of clarify key facts. Uh, those queries are very carefully structured so that they are idempotent, so if you ask the same question repeatedly, you're guaranteed to get the same answer, and they effectively form a database of facts about the compile. Then run it through code generation, get effectively an object file in memory, and then we relocate that back into our own code cache, and we'll talk about that a little bit in the future. The important part here is that by capturing that initial IR and capturing that database of facts, we are able to completely replay the entire compile outside of the VM and produce essentially the exact same assembly at the end. Uh, for those of you used to working on Clang, this may not seem like that big a deal because we're used to it. But in the space of managed languages, this is a huge enabler. Uh, the typical workflow is that it's something, say a compile happens half an hour under a run, because it's, it's a JIT. To reproduce that compile, you have to wait half an hour. With us, we save the IR the first time it happened, and we can reproduce it instantly and iterate and, and work on it without having to rerun the VM itself. So uh, once we get that object file in memory, uh, we go ahead and split it apart, par uh, parse out the data section, or sorry, we take the text section, relocate that into our own memory that we manage for execution, uh, and then we take most of the data sections, parse them apart, and throw them away. The only couple of exceptions to that are things like constants that get relocated near the text section in the code cache. What's interesting about this is that it means that most of the data sections to us are just data structures. We don't really care about the encoding, the size, any of those issues in any way, shape, or form. I also want to mention that our runtime does do code patching in various forms. We've talked about some of the mechanisms to do that in past years. And given the support is fairly mature in tree with patch points and state points and such, we're not really going to go into those pieces today. So now that we've got a compiler, we need to go ahead and get some good code out the back end. So what does Java actually look like? Uh, Java is a safe language that has uh, every memory access has been checked. There is at least a null check and often a range check and possibly a type check involved in every memory access. Uh, Java does not have undefined behavior in the same sense as C. We have well-defined overflow semantics on uh, integer overflow, for example. One of the sort of interesting subtleties, though, is that from the compiler's perspective, we actually don't get to assume all of these nice things about this safe language, because there's a loophole in the JDK called sunmisk unsafe that allows you to get past most of these checks and do raw memory access. So what we actually end up compiling is sort of a weird hybrid of something that in between Java and C. So to give you a brief feel for what a typical piece of Java code looks like, uh, we've got this loop on the left, which all it's doing is somebody's implemented their own vector class, and it's just summing up the internal array. That line in the middle there, which is actually doing the sum, expands out to what we're seeing on the right-hand side. Uh, it has a null check, the field load, another null check, a range check, and then finally the actual operation we'd like to optimize. What I want to emphasize here is that there's nothing fundamentally new for LLVM on this slide. If we run the right passes in the right order, for particular, if we do LICM, then unswitch, then LICM, then unswitch, then invars with some tweaks Android we'll talk about, and then the rest of the optimizer, we probably will get pretty actually good code on this. This brings back to sort of, a, sort of one of the key points in the project that has slightly surprised us, honestly, is we have needed to write very few custom passes. Instead, we found ourselves making small enhancements to the optimizer to improve its ability to handle the style of IR that we tend to create and convert it into something that looks more like C so the rest of the optimizer is able to, tr to trigger on it and sort of uh, actually generate high quality code. 
The only real exception to this is that we have a couple of higher level passes over our abstractions, but that's about it. So, having just said that, let me get to the counterexample. Uh, one of the traditional ways of compiling a managed or dynamic language so that you can actually get good performance out of it is to do cl a class of optimizations that are speculative, in that you make an assumption about something you'd like to be true that has been true to date, and you assume that is going to be true into the future. However, these speculations don't always hold, so we have to have a mechanism to correct them when they go wrong. Just give a little background on why you might want to do this. Remember that Java is a virtual dispatch by default language, which means every call we look at is virtual. At the top of the slide here, we've got an example where we're calling the method foo on an instance A, which is of type A. At compile time, we happen to know that there is no subclass of A which implements foo. So we can devirtualize this call and make it a direct call. There's a slight catch here, though, in that, say we had two such calls back to back. During the execution of that first call, it is possible that the Java programmer running goes off and does a class load event and loads a new class into the runtime that violates our assumptions. If that happens, if we've done this uh, devirtualization, we have to have a way to back out of the current compile before we get to executing that second call. Specifically, what this ends up meaning is that all of our invokes actually end up having three continuation points attached to them. We have the normal return edge and the normal uh, exceptional edge, as we're all used to from an invoke in LLVM. But we also have a third continuation point, which is back in the interpreter if it turns out one of our speculations was in fact violated. That uh, event, when we take that sort of speculation violation, and get back in the interpreter is known as the optimization. Specifically, what we're doing is we're replacing a single compiled frame with up to n interpreter frames, where the reason we have n is there's been inlining in the process. So there could have been multiple abstract frames that got inlined down in the physical frame that we're replacing. And then jumping back into the interpreter resume execution, because uh, it's going to be conservatively correct. To do this, we need to have at every call site the complete abstract state at that call. Specifically, this includes the information out of a fairly textbook implementation of the JVM spec. So you'll have your locals, uh, your stack slots, and your, and your lock stack. But it also means there's a sequence point that implies that uh, side effects can only happen once if we actually take this, this extraordinary edge. Um, so let's think, think a little bit about what the runtime needs to take a compiled frame and map it into n interpreted frames. So in an abstract sense, it sort of needs to relate the two things, right? It needs, to, uh, it needs to know that the second element on the expression stack of the third interpreted frame is an RBX in the compiled frame. And the front end needs to emit this map into the IR in some form, because there's no way to recover this information late. And it needs to persist throughout optimization and code generation. And as Philip said, uh, barring some complications we won't go into today, uh, this uh, map is only needed at call sites because that's where invalidation happens. And, and also, call sites need to act as sequence points because part of the abstract state is the number of the set of side effects that have been issued up to that point. So you can't reorder side effects across calls that can de-optimize. So, um, so let's break this up a little bit, and let's first talk about the code generation and the lowering aspects of de-optimization state. De-optimization state is another uh, term for abstract VM state. So, uh, so the, the sub-problem here is you have the abstract VM state or the de-optimization state at a call side. You know what it is. And then how do you lower it in a way that your runtime can use it? So it's a four-step process. The first thing you do is you encode or serialize your abstract VM state into a sequence of values, which we'll call deopt arguments. This is pretty straightforward. Um, then you wrap the potentially deoptimizing call in a state point, stack map, or patch point, three intrinsics that LLVM has. And these intrinsics have slots where you can feed in the deopt arguments, uh, and you do that. And then you run your normal code generation pipeline. And what LLVM will do for you is uh, it'll materialize the sequence of deopt arguments at the call site and it will record the locations in which it was materialized in the stack map section. 
Uh, and your runtime can then read the stack map section and figure out where the abstract VM state is when, the, when your thread is at that call site. So um, that was lowering. That's basically a late representation. And we have had su support for uh, late representation since before the last dev meeting. So that's pretty old. That's, that's entry for a while. Um, but since we are using LVM for all our optimization needs, we also need a reasonable way to represent um, the op state early in the optimization pipeline, something that the optimizer can work over. And one obvious candidate is using the same mechanism, state points, patch, for, state points, patch points, or stack maps to represent the abstract VM state. But we prototyped this, and we realized they're not ideal for uh, mid-level optimizations, especially we ran into issues around getting the inliner to work nicely with these things. So that approach didn't work. So what, we went back to the whiteboard, and right now we're trying to upstream essentially a more principled version of what we had working internally for a while, which, which we call operand bundles. And operand bundles give you a principled sound way of encoding the opt state at a call site in LVM IR. So, this, so let's look at it syntactically first, because that's the easy part. So if you look at the first call on this slide, you have a normal call to function f, and you have the normal argument that you're passing to f, and then you have this funny syntax which encode, which has a sequence of tagged values, tagged with the string deopt inside a pair of square braces. And this sequence of values is the sequence of deopt arguments we were talking about. This, is, this encodes the deopt state at that call. And once you have this, we know, we've taught LVM to lower this using GC state point, um, and LVM can currently lower it using the same strategies by lowering it into a representation that we talked about earlier. And, and operand bundles in general are not specifically for deoptimization. They are more general than that. And we can use operand bundles to support things like uh, value injection and frame introspection in the future. And this is still pretty experimental, and we are still working incrementally entry um, on this. So, the optimization was a very broad class of things that we want LLVM to do for us. Now let's talk about some specific ways we've been trying to improve LLVM's optimizer. So null checks. Java has lots of them, because every field dereference has an implied null check. And we try to optimize these away. We try to, uh, for instance, unswitch them out of loops. But uh, like even idiomatic Java code will have some null checks that are just impossible to optimize away, just theoretically impossible to optimize away. And there's a standard solution for making this hurt less, which is uh, you don't do the null check at all. You issue the memory operation. And if it's sec faults, the runtime handles the sec fault and does uh, something appropriate with it. And the reason why that's not completely terrible is because uh, Java code typically never throws null pointer exceptions. If it throws a null pointer exception, that's usually a bug. So it's OK to make the extremely common case of not having to throw a null pointer exception, even if it makes the extremely rare case of having to throw a null pointer exception more expensive. So let's look at a concrete example. Um, so on the left-hand side, you have uh, some code that first checks RDI for null. If it is null, it branches to is null and it returns 42 here. But in a typical Java program, it would actually have code to construct a null pointer exception object and then throw it. And then, then after that, you have a load from RDI. So we have a pass in LLVM, which runs during code generation on exactly this representation after register allocation, um, which will transform it to the assembly on the right. So what you see here is the null check has com been completely removed, and you have a label marking the dereference operation, and you already had a label for the um, throwing operation. And the pass creates a map called, the, called LVM fault maps that maps the potentially faulting PC, which is the load, uh, to the handling PC, which is, is null here. And if the load actually sec falls, the runtime will um, redirect control to is null, and then it'll do whatever it used to do. And the interesting thing here is, um, we need to ensure that we get a sec fault if and only if RDI is null. So we need to ensure that the displacement in the load instruction falls within the first page, because then if RDI is null, we'll try to dereference the null page. And we also need to guarantee that RDI is either null or dereferenceable up to the first 36 bytes. Um, that's, we have a more general property than that, and we'll talk about that later. So this is what we talked about, the 
we have a pass called enable imp implicit null checks, which uh, does a transformation and creates a map that the runtime can use to know where to redirect control if it gets a sec fault. And this is a profile gated optimization because you don't really want a segmentation fault on the hot path of your application. And we have some tricks in our runtime around uh, recompiling when we figure out that uh, implicit null check has actually become hot now. But that's out of scope for today. OK, so after range checks, we have, uh, sorry, after null checks, we have range checks. And again, we have lots of range checks in Java because every array access is checked. Uh, that we check that the index is inbounds. And we've so what we've, the way we've been trying to make LVM better at optimizing range checks is we've just tried to make scalar evolution smarter. We'll see some examples of, uh, examples of that, specific examples. And what we have observed is we don't really need a separate range check elision pass. And Invar Simplify really asks the right questions and gets scalar evolution to do most of the heavy lifting and to simplify, uh, simplify away range checks. And one important point here is because Java does not have undefined behavior on signed overflow, we don't get any NSWs from our front end. So we have to infer them. We have to make Skev work harder and infer NSW where it can. So let's look at a specific example of how we've been making scalar evolution smarter. Um, on the left-hand side, you have a pretty simple loop, a uh, pretty normal loop. And you have half a range check. You can imagine this was a full range check at some point, and half of it got optimized away. And now you're just checking that i is not negative. Um, and you want to do something better. You want to optimize this. So the very first thing we have to do is we need to figure out, we need to discover the fact that the increment is NSW. That's pretty simple in this case. So let's say we do that, and we, we get rid of, um, I mean, we now know that the increment would never overflow. Now the second thing to observe here is the range check here, the half range check here, can only fail on the first iteration. Because if it didn't fail on the first iteration, then we know that i started out positive. And because i does not sign wrap, we know that it'll never become negative. So we can strength reduce this loop varying check into a loop invariant check. And that can be optimized later by loop on switch and so on. So this is, this is something we found very useful in some Java benchmarks. So this is also something that came up in real Java code uh, from a benchmark that shall remain unnamed, but I think you know which one it is. But, um, so on the left-hand side, you have a, a loop that has a decrementing controlling induction variable, which goes from L minus 1 to uh, till it hits 0. And then you have an uh, incrementing induction variable that we use to do a range check and do an array access after that. And here, since we know the back edge taken count of the loop, we can infer how many times at most, j is incremented. And that lets us infer the range of j, and then that lets us get rid of the range check. So let's talk about something scalar evolution does not do today. Um, right now, the way uh, scalar evolution simplifies uh, predicates is it looks at a dominating predicate, con like controlling the loop entry and the loop back edge, and uses that to simplify away a single predicate. And it specifically does not try to look at multiple dominating predicates and combine them in an interesting way to come up with a stronger dominating predicate. So for instance, in this example, we really want scalar evolution to say that, hey, I know i is less than k, and I also know k is less than l, so I should be able to infer i is less than l uh, by transitivity. And this is something scalar evolution doesn't do today, and getting it to do this efficiently is, uh, is something we're thinking about. OK. so. We talked about cases where the range check is redundant. We want LVM to be smart enough to prove that the range check never fails. But what about cases where that's theoretically impossible? So here on the left-hand side, we have a loop that runs from 0 to n, where n is some arbitrary integer. And we have a range check on i. And specifically, we don't know that n's greater than a dot length or less than, and we don't have any information about it. So we have this pass entry, which, call, which is called inductive range check elimination. Um, so what it does is for really hot loops, it'll split the iteration space of the loop in a way that it can run some of the iterations without doing a range check. And so in this case, you can see it splits it into two halves, and it, it only needs to do a range check on the second half. And, and if you think a little bit harder, you'll see that the second loop is not really a loop. It'll either fail the range check or uh, not run at all. But that's a separate optimization. This is actually interestingly similar to uh, what the poly guys have been doing. Uh, they mentioned this in their talk yesterday. And this is a little more specific than the work they've been doing. Their work is much more general. OK. So um, 
when we were talking about implicit null checks, uh, I mentioned that RDI was known to be either dereferenceable, either null or dereferenceable up to the first 36 bytes. Um, so it, this is Java, references in Java have a more general property than that, in the sense that we can usually, uh, references are usually either null or dereferenceable up to n bytes, where n is a function of its type. Uh, so this is barring sun misc unsafe, because then anything goes. But let, we, we're not going to digress there. So here, for instance, you have a loop, not exactly a loop, a badly written loop, um, which has a load from ARR, which we know is an array. And the load from ARR is guarded by some arbitrary condition that we cannot analyze. However, the loop is also guarded by ARR not being null. So what we can do here is we can speculate the load of ARR arrow length to the preheader. We don't really care about what condition is because condition cannot influence the dereferenceability of that load. Um, this is something we get from Java, not true, obviously, for C. And the way we encode this in LLVM is we introduce an attribute called dereferenceable, dereferenceable or null. So it's a mouthful, uh, which takes a constant parameter. And we can, you can tag loads and function calls with it. And it says that a, it, it denotes that a particular value is either null or dereferenceable up to n bytes. Uh, so that's, that's, and we also got uh, things like LICM to work with this attribute and be more aggressive about speculating loads. So an open question is around uh, arrays, because in Java we also know that if the length of an array is L, the first L elements in that array are dereferenceable, and we can speculate loads from those elements. And right now there's no way in LVM to denote that, and maybe one way to do that is um, have dereferenceable or null be able to accept a runtime value. But that's, a, that's kind of an open question for us. All right, so related to dereferenceability, we also have aliasing. And going into our project, we, we had initially planned that we'll have to spend a lot of time teaching LLVM about Java's really expressive type system and what can alias what and what can't alias what. However, we've, for now, we've only been using fairly, coarse, fairly coarsely using things like TBA and struct TBA. And we tell LLVM that, hey, this, is, this loads a double, and this stores an int, and they can't alias, and that sort of thing. We don't really encode Java's class hierarchy into LLVM IR. And that's been working fairly well. Like, we're not, we haven't found obvious cases, obvious optimizations that we're missing because of this. Uh, we also generalized the argmem-only attribute to non-intrinsics, to regular functions. And this is very helpful for us because a lot of the high-level abstractions Philip was talking about follow this pattern. They only touch their arguments. They only dereference their arguments. So, um, and LVM can optimize them better. We also heavily use constant memory, uh, sorry, invariant load, the invariant load metadata, because for us, for instance, we know that the length of an array never changes. Uh, Java semantics disallows anything from changing the length of an array once it's constructed. So whatever load gives you the length of an array can be marked with invariant load, and you can move it around calls and things like that without worrying about aliasing. And we also use invariant load for uh, Java-level constant pointers, in the sense that static finals that are point to a constant object. And uh, th that's, that's because you can't really constant fold the addresses because they're the, you don't know what the address is. The GC is going to keep moving them. But we use those to mark the loads that give you what the object is at the, like, currently. Um, so there are some open problems that uh, we'd like to spend more time uh, thinking about in the future. Um, first of all is there's no uh, way in LVM to encode that a bit of memory becomes constant after a certain point. So a good example of this is final fields in Java. They can't change once the constructor is run, but before the constructor is finished, they can be changed. So we'd like to tell LVM that uh, after this point, this, these memory locations are constant. So you can exploit that once you know that the constructor is run. Um, and there are also some subtly different but overlapping ways to encode the same thing. Like the backend's notion of invariant load is slightly different from the mid-level optimizer's notion of invariant load. And then TBA has this different thing called is constant. And we think there's, there's some scope for coming up with a general single unified abstraction or notation for denoting all of these things. So Sandro has covered all of the sort of interesting parts of the optimizer work we've done. Uh, let me sort of summarize the takeaways from the project, sort of the lessons we're hoping others might learn. 
The first one is this embedded IR has been a really interesting notion. Uh, it's been incredibly enabling in allowing us to iterate quickly and try out different points in designing the high level and low level IR. And as I mentioned previously, we didn't really have the experience going in to know what the right answer was. If we'd had to make that choice once and sort of get stuck with it and moving things back and forth between the high level and the low level was challenging, it would have been really problematic. This has been a very powerful thing for us. Uh, I do want to say I'm not necessarily going to assert we're going to stay with the idea of an embedded IR forever. We might very well pull some of the pieces that we've developed in this embedded notion into a higher level IR at some point, but we have no plans to do so in the immediate future. Uh, we have added the support for the operand bundle uh, mechanism. In addition to some of the things we've already talked about, there's other people in the community who are making noises. These might be useful, for example, in some of the Windows exception handling or other areas like that. Really encourage you to think about them and see what other use cases you might find, because Sandroid is still in the process of landing these patches. So if there's changes that need to be made to accommodate your use case, please let him know. Hey, I'm always happy to volunteer him for work. <laughs> And then one of the things that I find is really surprising to people when we talk about this project and sort of the success we've had with it is that almost all of our work can be viewed as canonicalization. Uh, it's really making sure the optimizer is able to canonicalize the IR that is typical of what our front end emits into something that looks more like typical C code. Our experience has been that the optimizer is very good at generating good code once we do that canonicalization. But doing the per language work to add those canonicalization rules is an absolute key requirement. Uh, and then finally, just want to close with sort of the observation that we are very happy with LLVM as a platform for building a debuggable managed language compiler. Uh, and I maybe keep hitting this point a bit much, but the ability to replay those compiles and have all of the debugging and diagnostic tools that come along with LLVM has been a godsend. Next slide. And with that, we're done. We'll open it up to any questions anybody has. Okay, let's thank the speakers. <laughs> so we have a microphone over there on the right for, uh, for anyone on that side of the room. and. Anyone over here, I'll try to run the mic to you. Let's see, any questions? So I'll start us off with a quick question. Uh, I thought the uh, work you were talking about for removing checks was quite interesting. I was wondering, had you done any benchmarking to evaluate um, like what performance benefit, like gains that gets, or what the costs are if you don't do those checks? We can't talk about specific numbers, but they do help. Like, it's all benchmark driven. Like, we look at benchmarks, see what, what's preventing us from generating optimal code for that benchmark, and th that's what drives us, drives our decisions. Yeah. Mm, thanks. And I'll also say, it's very rarely the direct cost of the check yes. that is the important part. It's almost always the check is preventing some other optimization from kicking in. And that's where the primary performance difference actually is. Uh, do you envision any other uh, useful IR extensions to help support these kinds of embedded high-level semantics? I think we're running out of things that are immediately obvious that we plan to upstream. Uh, it's entirely possible that we'll come up with more things as we work. So, for example, the argmem only thing was a fairly recent discovery when we really started pushing the aliasing and discovered that our abstractions were problematic. Looking at sort of, okay, what properties do these abstractions have? Oh, there's this existing notion that already applies to LLVM's intrinsics, but not LLVM functions. Oh, we can generalize that. That gives us what we need. I suspect we'll continue to see those types of small changes. Uh, I don't know of any other big changes that are in our current pipeline, but that might change. Um, there are some interesting things we can do about um, expressing control dependencies directly in the IR. Like, one thing that does by does is right now there's no way to express that this load is control dependent on that check. Like, for instance, if it's an array access and it's, it's dependent only on um, satisfying the range check and no other conditions are actually relevant. So there's no way to express that right now. And maybe that's something we might want to explore so do you mean, a long time in the future, not immediately. Do you mean expressing control independence? 
um, control dependence. Like I want to say that this operation is control dependent solely on that predicate. And if that predicate is satisfied, this can be speculated. No other condition actually influences whether you can speculate this or not. Thanks. Um, that sort of thing. But that's still pretty far away in the future. Uh, so your examples are all looking at Java code, which is yes. very natural. But Java is also a target for many other languages. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at uh, the performance challenges that non-Java languages targeting the JVM might I'll say provide? we've certainly run some benchmarks for other uh, languages. Uh, I do have to say our primary target right now is Java. We have enough work still to do on the Java side that we haven't been going looking for work. Uh, the general experience has been that things that tend to improve Java workloads also tend to improve non-Java workloads, at least so far. Any more questions? Okay, in that case, let's uh, thank our speakers again.